aircraft is a relic of the past, like me, I suppose. But then there are lots of us old Lancaster pilots about, but only three of these. And this is the only one that'll fly. And the flight mechanics are working on it now. And when the Air Force first acquired it, they gave it the number plate KMB. Well, KM were the code letters for 44 Squadron. And this is the squadron tie. I am entitled to wear it. And B. Baker, that was the aircraft's call sign. Well, why did the Air Force do that out of all the 7,000 Lancasters that were built? Well, for the answer to that, we have to go back to the spring of 1942. The first clue lies far away in Germany, deep in South Bavaria. Ein Gruß aus der alten Fuggerstadt Augsburg. This is the heart of old Augsburg, center of the arts, trade, and social enlightenment since the times of Augusta, Emperor of Rome. It's the birthplace of Holbein, home of Mozart, and it's the city where Dr. Rudolf Diesel built the first of the engines that powered the tanks, trucks of Hitler's armies, and powered the U-boats of his navies. The battle of the Atlantic must be won in a decisive manner. An intense, unrelenting struggle is being waged to bring in the endless stream of munitions and food without which our war effort here cannot be maintained. Winston Churchill has always spoke bravely, but the chances were in 1942 that Britain would starve within the year unless the U-boats could be stopped. One thing that could be done was to attack their bases, construction yards, and engine works. The only force that had a hope of doing that was Bomber Command. Not a lot of hope with their aging Hamdens and unloved Manchesters that were mostly based in Lincolnshire and Yorkshire. But a new and better bomber still on the secret list had started to come off the production lines. This big black beauty, the Avro Lancaster. Air Marshal Harris, the bomber chief, decided to intervene in the Battle of the Atlantic. He had two Lancaster squadrons, 44 at Waddington and 97 at Woodhall Spa. And he decided to commit them both to attack the main U-boat engine works at Augsburg in Bavaria. It was a bold conception. His crews were trained to fly high, to fly at night, to fly individually. For this, they were going to have to fly low in formation and in daylight. He sent the operation order here to St. Vincent's in Grantham, number five group headquarters. At Waddington and Woodhall Spa, selected crews were taken off normal operations to train in the kind of flying that they were going to have to do. practice flights had their alarming moments, as Flying Officer Rodley soon discovered. We carried out about a week's practice of um, these low-level cross-countries, and uh, I had one rather exciting experience when uh, I saw ahead of us the radio masts at Rugby, and I, as far as I could tell, the leading two Vicks hadn't seen them. Now, I've, I've got pretty good eyes, and I, I could uh, imagine that in, in rather misty conditions that they hadn't seen them. We had been told not to use the radio, but uh, I thought I'd better just mention it. 
I had my hand on the transmit button just as the they obviously saw these masts because the next thing I saw was six aircraft in plan view climbing over these uh, masts. Six aircraft were made ready, plus one reserve at both the airfields. Each carried a full fuel load of 2,154 gallons of 100 octane aviation fuel. Four 1,000 pound bombs with 11 second time fuses and full ammunition trays for the three gun turrets. Briefing was in the early afternoon of a fine April day. And we will let you know your target area and time of takeoff. You can't tell now whether this was actually the briefing room at Woodhall Spa. The nature's been taking over for the last 40 years or so, but it was a building very like this. And until the briefing, only the section leaders knew what the target was, and they were sworn to secrecy, even from their own crews. And then when the operations staff pulled back the curtain on the map and showed the target, there was a burst of incredulous laughter. Nobody had ever been that far into Germany before in nighttime, let alone in daylight. From Lincolnshire, the route crossed the channel to a point near Deauville. Then east to Lake Constance, where it swung northeast to Amazee, the final turning point. The distance over hostile land was nearly 600 miles. told that the, the big guns, the 88s and so on, couldn't fire down that low. But we were worried about 303 and the small flak stuff. And uh, somebody mentioned the fact that it would be rather painful if something came up through the bottom of the aircraft and through the seat. And uh, I noticed that people were walking around with pieces of armor plate which they'd got from the armory. And I thought, why am I almost the last to think of these things? So eventually, I decided to rely on my old steel helmet, which I put underneath my cushion and sat the rest of the journey rocking gently from side to side. The six Lancasters from Waddington were led by squadron leader John Nettleton from South Africa, a comparatively inexperienced operational pilot, and the six from Woodhall Spa by squadron leader John Sherwood, who had already earned the DFC and bar. Nettleton's aircraft was KM B. Baker. The Bomber Command planners had done their best. The route had been selected to avoid Luftwaffe airfields in France. Fighter Command helped by mounting a diversion to keep the German fighters busy at the time when the Lancasters would cross the French coast. A hundred Spitfires patrolled over Calais and escorted formations of Boston light bombers. Boston's mission was to attack targets on both sides of the Lancaster's route. A 
Unfortunately, they only serve to stir up a hornet's nest. With the benefit of hindsight, it might have been better if the Spitfires had escorted the Lancasters across the coast and as far into France as their fuel would allow. Nettleton's formation was a few miles north of Sherwood's, and as ill luck would have it, they ran into a section of the Richtofen Geschwader, a crack fighter squadron. They'd been scrambled to attack the diversionary Bostons and were flying home to base when they saw the British bombers. The Lancasters were heavily outnumbered and outgunned. One by one, the rearmost aircraft were riddled by machine gun and cannon fire. The third to be shot down brought the Richtofen's tally of Allied aircraft destroyed to exactly 1,000. Only one made a safe crash landing. The pilot, Warrant Officer Crum, DFC, showed extraordinary skill, which didn't end with the landing. Bert Doughty, who was in the front turret, remembers well what happened. Unfortunately, he did a wonderful job and landed us from 200 feet, wheels up, straight across three fields before we came to rest. I couldn't do very little at all except just realise that behind me, we'd left with four 1,000-pound bombs with 11-second delayed fuses, and I thought they were still hung up in the aircraft. At this particular point, I tried to get myself out by taking one of my guns to smash through the turret, and then uh, the next thing I knew was an axe blade come through my turret, and that was my skipper trying to axe me out, which I eventually got out through the hole and uh, got my feet on terra firma. The fourth Lancaster to go down, one of Nettleton's wingmen, was destroyed by Major Ursau, an ace fighter pilot, and the Richtofen's commander. Nettleton's B. Baker and A. Apple, flown by Flying Officer Garwell, survived the onslaught of the 109s. Their orders were that if any of the formation were lost, the mission had to be abandoned. Nettleton turned a blind eye to that. He and Garwell flew on. Still south of Nettleton, Sherwood's six Lancasters swept low across the fields of France. Some 10 minutes ahead, Nettleton and Garwell found what they were looking for. The shining waters of the lake, the Amazee. Until they reached the lake, it had seemed to the defences that Munich was the target, but there they turned north to find the river Lech, which would lead them into Augsburg. The factory lay in the northeast of the town, in a fork made by the confluence of the Lech and the river Vertak.
when the Lancasters approached, it was the last day of the annual carnival, the Palera. Bands were playing, and people were enjoying themselves, singing and dancing in the medieval streets. There were swings and roundabouts and all the fun of the fair. Up the road to the north, men at the engine works could hear the sounds of the Palera as they went in for the night shift. Munitions work apart, the war had hardly touched the people here, and they were so far from the war fronts that it had never occurred to them that they might be attacked. <laughs> Life in Augsburg wasn't all fun, however. Like all boys in Germany, Augsburg's boys had to join the Hitler Youth. Karl Domling was one of them. Heavy motors could be heard. Motors of planes, of heavy planes. And then we looked in the direction of the noise and we saw over there planes coming very low over the forest. We saw the signs of Royal Air Force. And we were very astonished to see English planes here at daylight. Littleton and Garwell came in low over the town, in between these chimneys. The people in the Plara hadn't even heard the sirens, or they affected to ignore them. Some of them pointed and laughed and waved as the Lancasters roared overhead. The target was this assembly shed down here. Knock that out, they were told, and all the rest would stop. It was the bottleneck theory. The bomb doors opened, the 1,000 pounders fell. The 11 second delay fuses began to work. Nettleton banked away, Garwell followed. Then an 88 millimeter flak gun on one of the towers over there opened fire. Garwell was hit. Within seconds, all the fuselage behind the cabin was burning. Karl Heinz Meinecke, a young typesetter and himself a budding pilot, watched the apple roar overhead, flaming like a meteor. I was seeing how he put in, in this valley, this uh, aeroplane. I thought it uh, was a good landing. Here is a railroad, and the other side is a water. And then came uh, the little hill, so he couldn't find another one place. That was the best place in the whole area. as possible, I take my bicycle and was going down here in this valley and found the plane in the valley and three men were standing here. And uh, in the sinking sun, I was uh, seeing the arm of the gunner holding in the air. And that was uh, such an impression for me that uh, I remember me today on that. Sherwood's six aircraft, still unmolested, now approached the target, and all the guns in Augsburg were ready for their coming. towards this assembly hall. The bomb aim was shouting enthusiastically that it was just like the photographs. And uh, I could hear light flak bouncing off the aircraft. 
and uh, the throttles were certainly bent forward, far beyond the normal stops. The bomb aimer thought that he wasn't going to be able to get his bombs onto the roof of this shed, and I attempted to help him by banging the aircraft and pulling hard on the stick in an effort to throw the bombs sideways in through the wall. I noticed that from Sherwood's aircraft on my left, a stream of white smoke emitted. I thought he'd be all right. It was probably a petrol leak or coolant leak. But unfortunately, it turned black, and I realized that he was on fire. He decelerated and started to go behind me, and losing height at the same time. And looking down on him, I could see through a little square hatch in the top of the aircraft, which you can see back there, which had burned away, that the flames inside the fus fuselage were like a blowtorch. I told my rear gunner to keep his eye on the aircraft and see what happened. And shortly afterwards, he told me that the aircraft had hit the ground and had burst into flames, looking very much like a chrysanthemum of fire. Sherwood's aircraft crashed here in these woods near Emmasaka. Exploded, a heap of burning debris. In due course, the next of kin were informed. And Mrs. Sherwood thanked the officer who called on her and said that she was sure her husband had survived. And she was right. Miraculously, he was thrown through the windscreen like a stone from a catapult. And his fall was broken by the branches of one of these trees. Warrant Officer Tom Mycock, DFC, was in the section following Sherwood's. His aircraft, too, was mortally hit on the approach to the target, but he carried on and dropped his bombs. Cox's aircraft was hit on the bombing run. He could have climbed away, bailed out, saved himself and the crew. And he didn't choose to do that. He and they lie here. They lie alongside Sherwood's crew and three of Garwell's. All those pilots showed what we used to call the, the press-on spirit. The moment they saw that line drawn on the briefing room map. Uh, they knew what they were in for. They knew what was expected of them. And they didn't fail. Reduced to cold statistics, the results of the Augsburg raid weren't exactly cataclysmic. 32 bombs were dropped. 17 of them hit the factory. And five were duds. Of 2,700 machine tools, less than 3% were damaged or destroyed. There were a number of cranes, a bridge, and a lot of window panes smashed. But the production of U-boat engines hardly paused. But that wasn't the point. The main point was the effect on morale, back in beleaguered Britain and here in Germany. For us at home, it meant not so much that the tide had turned, but at least it wasn't flowing against us all the way. And here in Germany, it meant that the bombers could get through. Even in broad daylight, Hermann Goering's mighty Luftwaffe hadn't been able to stop them. And what they'd done once, they could do again. Twelve Augsburgers were killed at the factory, a remarkably small number. But every death was a heartbreak for someone, and Augsburg mourned its dead. Three years later, when a thousand bombers struck, the death rate was horrific, and the town was devastated.
but that was for the future. On that April evening in 1942, as dusk fell over Germany, five Lancasters were flying back to Lincolnshire. Nettleton alone of the six from Wallington and the four from Woodhall Spa, all of them were damaged. doesn't go for places because they're marked with three stars in the guidebook. It goes for places like Augsburg, which make diesel engines for U-boats, even when it means a flight of a thousand miles over hostile country. At the Ministry of Information, in the presence of Mr. Brendan Bracken, the press and newsreels met squadron leader Nettleton, the first South African VC of the war, and his comrades. I believe you were flying very low all the time. Did the local inhabitants cheer you on the way? No, we saw some occasional Frenchmen waving and... Some Germans waving. Uh -huh. Did they realize you were British? I don't know. I, I don't think they realized what we were at all. I certainly didn't, actually. And when you arrived at Augsburg, could you see the target clearly? Yes, we did. We saw it from about seven miles away. The raid was acclaimed by the press. The surviving air crew were acclaimed as heroes. There was a Victoria Cross for John Nettleton, a DSO for David Penman of 97 Squadron, a DFC for Rod Rodley, and eight other officers. 13 NCOs got DFMs, but then, for me, every man deserves a gong. With medals, though, comparisons are often odious. And that was certainly true of John Sherwood's case. Like John Nettleton, Sherwood was recommended by his CO for a Victoria Cross, and that was heartily endorsed by Air Marshal Harris. But somewhere higher up, Someone scribbled on that citation to be used for DSO, if found to be alive. And that's what Sherwood got. More importantly, perhaps, Mrs. Sherwood got her husband back, just as she knew she would. As for the 21 who left their bones in France, and those 16 in Dernbach Cemetery, well, their gallantry is marked by the headstones on their graves and remembered by those who knew their story.